like uh, before we even had agriculture and farming. Uh, what was like the earliest form when uh, if I wanted something, I'd have to like trade something for it? What was that called, by the way? If I wanted, uh, let's say you had a nice sharpened stick, and I had a nice uh, warm animal hide, and I want your sharpened stick, what's my only really means here? Barter? Yeah, barter, right? It's like I'd have to just trade you what I have for what you have. There's no like money or anything like that. Sure, we could potentially trade favors. I could do work for you or whatever, but you have to like trade something for something. Okay, that's called barter. That's like the earliest stuff. Barter. All right, let me get you your Morgan Buck for that. Peter. All right. I'm going to say names of people that I don't know yet, so it helps me remember who you are. Uh, half the class I've had you before, so. But Peter, that'll stick. Um, so that's barter. Why might barter not be the best way to trade things? Because you can't determine. Yeah, exactly. It's really hard to determine the true value of something, right? So if like, if you want to trade me for shoes, like, well, what the hell do you trade me for? Like, what's worth a shoe? Like, it's really hard to determine that between people. It's always going to change. Uh, so it becomes not a very good system. All right, so we end up moving on, uh, especially when we develop uh, agriculture for the first time in human history, like 8,000 years ago. We start farming and staying in one place. Uh, what becomes like the most common form of trade uh, once we start harvesting agriculture? Yeah, or grains. grains, grains for the most part, yeah. And then they, they even got to beer too and they figured out how to make that, right? So it went from bartering objects to uh, one of the first forms of currency we had of like something that everybody would want and could agree on uh, where it was basically grains. Uh, and then again later, uh, beer as well. That was a big one for the uh, Egyptians building the pyramids. All right, cool. <coughs> got that. Um, the systems we use today of like using money in banks and things like that. Um, why do we have them? Like someone just make them up and they forced us to use them? Why, why would we use these things? Why don't we do this stuff anymore? Why are we not trading uh, grains and why aren't we trading objects for things? Why do we use money in banks and credit and stuff like that? It's more universal. More universal? Why is it more universal though? You're right, that's what everyone uses, but like, why do they use it? Did somebody like force us all to do it and shove it down our throats and we don't want to do it? Is it like more efficient? Yeah, it's way more efficient. It's way easier. It's more reliable, more efficient. So that's, that's the whole point of economics is like, we want to learn how to get as much stuff to people that helps them out as possible. And the best way to do that is to do it the most easy way, uh, which we find out. So I mentioned a couple of them, but what are some of the uh, new techniques that we started using uh, that made things more easy. Let's actually start with the first one here. Uh, the Greeks uh, and Persians kind of popularized this, uh, a common way, a uh, form of money besides the grain. Minted coins. Yeah, minted coins. What's a minted coin? It's like um, they get like all the loot and like jewelry and stuff that they find and it melts it down into coins. Exactly. So that's one of the first ones were minted coins. Right, and this is in the classical era. Um, so it's like basically 500 CE, BCE to 500 CE or so. So that, that's like 2,500 years ago. Right, and um, uh, the big problem was if I took over a city and I was paying my army, it's really hard to divide the loot up and then give them random pieces of, uh, uh, of gold, for example. So if like, if a king that a king when you took over had like a bunch of jewelry and vases and altars and stuff, if I give you a gold ring and then the only other piece of gold is this giant gold plate. Is that a fair distribution? No, like you get way more gold if you get the plate. So the best way they found to evenly uh, distribute it was just to melt it down in these little stamped gold coins so they're all the same size and they could pay everybody. And that made it way easier to buy other things too. All right, cool. Uh, what are a couple other things that made it much easier to uh, uh, engage in transactions with people besides the minted coins? So further on down the line. Credit, right, so what's credit? Um, yeah, so you gotta have that trust for sure because if, if you're like, hey, can I have that, I'll pay you later, I could just not pay you later. Uh, but if there's some sort of, sort of trust uh, between us or there's some sort of punishment for if I don't uh, pay you back, which is why you have contracts now that the state enforces, um, then it's possible to you know, uh, sell me something in advance and I pay you off over time or pay you later. Right, those all make activity much uh, more quick and efficient. What else we got? What if I got a bunch of stuff? I got like checks. Checks, cool. So um, what do I need though to have a check? Like yes, checks totally work. Check, uh, the notes, the um, paper you write on it. Yeah, that's true too. Um, 
But where the checks emerge from are, are banks. So you got the bank note and you got the check. Uh, I need the bank first. So banks are going to be popularized. So I can put my gold, silver, other assets there. Uh, and yes, the first form of paper money became those bank notes. Uh, and what could I do with those bank notes if I got it, if I wanted to go to the bank? What could I do with those bank notes? Yeah, you can exchange it with the silver or gold or whatever assets. That's right. So you mentioned the uh, bank notes. And of course, uh, you guys all know this. If I want to give you some money for my account, uh, I could write you a check, right? I would have my bank account number on it. You have to go to my bank, uh, and then you would have to uh, have my signature on it, obviously, and then you can withdraw the money uh, for that. And that's a check. That's another much easier way uh, to pay people. So banks allow us to safely keep our money somewhere, but also we now have paper money to use, and we have checks, and that makes uh, transactions even easier. So now I don't have to like, lug around my gold and silver and possibly have it stolen. Uh, I could just write you a check uh, or uh, use much more lighter, more concealable uh, paper money in banknotes. All right, cool. So those are all definitely improvements, and that's why we have them. And again, don't just think this is some like arbitrary thing people forced on us. We adopted these things, and they grew because they worked so well. Uh, that's why they're universal. All right, cool. However, prior to roughly 1750, this is like when we have our, our major shift, what you call modern economics, the, uh, the systems we use uh, now. Before that, though, it, it was quite different. Uh, they didn't trust you to make things. Um, in fact, you had no actual control uh, or anything for the most part. Uh, we're we're going to focus on Europe because that's where the system emerged from, but just know this, it's pretty much true in the entire world. I forgot to get money for the last couple of people. I'll get you. Um, it's pretty much true across the entire world that they had a very similar system to this. Now this system, I think you guys covered it last week when I was gone. Uh, it's a system where you are born into a class and no matter what, you are stuck in that class. So if you're born at the bottom, you're just stuck at the bottom. It doesn't matter if you're smart or motivated or anything like that. What is that? What was that system called? Caste system. Okay, yeah, it, it is a type of caste system. Uh, we call it, in, in uh, Europe anyway, feudalism, but it's the same idea. Whatever you're born into, whatever class, you're stuck there. Who's in charge of you if you're born at the bottom? The yeah, the king, the knights, the lords, everyone who's above you, essentially. So um, throughout the entire world, you have some form of caste system, uh, and we're gonna, we're gonna say feudal system to keep it simple in Europe here, but it's the same thing essentially. And this means wherever I'm born is my permanent status. I can't go up at all, right? And we had that hierarchy, and you, you actually mentioned some of them. So you the king at the top, the nobles, uh, knights, which are just professional soldiers really. At the very bottom, you have what are called peasants uh, and serfs. Sucks to be these guys. Well, let me catch up on the money thing. I know you had one, you had one. Julia had one, you had one. Did I miss anybody? Who? Oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Perfect. Now I got everybody. Okay. <clears throat> that's the feudal system. So I believe this was on the notes. If it's not, you can tell me. If I was a peasant, how much freedom did I have? Elaborate. What do you mean I have none? I can't breathe and eat? Um, the king and the noble, you had to farm for them. And exactly. Them right. I was, I was farming for them specifically. Okay, cool. So the people that actually had all the land was technically the king and the nobility. Nobody else had land. You were renting it uh, from these guys. So let's just take a random plot of land. Let's say this is a huge amount of area, like a city size. All right. The lord or the king, uh, they're in their manor, their big almost castle-like house, right, here they are, there's the Lord. Uh, if I'm on this land, I'm not a person, what am I? Property. I'm their property for the most part, exactly. So if I'm a peasant or a serf, um, I am on this land. Can I leave? No. no, you can't, you are bound to that land. Okay, so uh, what is this land called that I'm on? Private property. It was not private property, actually, yet. Common, Common land, right, common land for that one too. Common land uh, meant that we all used it uh, together. So these peasants would, uh, they could use it to hunt or gather food or farm, um, and they would use that to live. What would they do with any extra they had though? So if I farmed, like let's say I was a really good farmer, and I made more food than I needed, 
what do I do with the extra? Yeah, it, it doesn't just go to myself or whoever I want. It all goes to the Lord, essentially. Right? That's how I pay my, my labor, my rent for living on this land. So all excess stuff that I create uh, goes to the, uh, to the Lord. So incentives are, you know, things that motivate me to do something. If all of my hard labor, like, like, like I said, let's say this peasant is a total badass and outproduces everybody else for food. Uh, what does he get for it? Does he get a reward? No. no. Where does it all go? It goes to the Lord, right. So does he have really any incentive to uh, work harder or find a better way of farming or make more food? No, because no, he's not going to get anything for it. Right, so this is a, a, a bad system in that people are not motivated to do anything more than the bare minimum. All right, sometimes they can't even get to the bare minimum. All right, but this idea is called common land. And the reason why we call it common land is anyone on it can use it however they want, but it's not theirs. They farm it and live off of it, and anything extra they get, it goes to the Lord. And again, what we can see here is you have no reason to try harder, to try new ways to make more food, because you don't even get it, so why would you try? Who cares? All right, so that is, that is a bad system. So why the hell did they have this system then? Why did they think this was a good idea? Because the top thought it was a good idea. Why did they think it was a good idea, though? You're right. These... These guys up here enforced it and thought it was a good idea, but they actually had a reason. They were wrong in their reason, but they actually had a reason. Why did they enforce this system on uh, people? And again, this isn't just in Europe. This is a similar system to what is run throughout the whole world prior to the uh, uh, 1700s. If you were born in a and you're better? Yes, they actually believed they were superior, right? Now, they have different religions, obviously, but in some way or another, they believed, if I was born in one of these higher <laughs> classes, as a king or a noble, uh, maybe even a soldier, a knight, certainly not a peasant though. If I was born up here, it's because God put me there because I am uh, magically uh, smarter or better and superior to everybody else, all right? So you didn't have a chance to show, again, if you're a peasant or even a soldier here, if you were really good at what you did or smart, uh, they believed you were automatically inferior because God put you in that class. If you were put here though, Clearly you are gifted by God with wisdom and ability and intelligence. So you don't listen to these guys. They don't know what the hell they're talking about. Everything should go to these guys because they're God's chosen uh, people in that they're smarter and more wise and better. Does that make sense? All right. I know it sounds weird now, but that was what everyone believed in the whole world up to about like 500 years ago or so. People started questioning that. Until that point, this was like standard knowledge. There wasn't really any questioning it. All right, that's why people didn't own anything. Everything was owned by these guys because they thought they were actually superior, better, smarter, etc. All right, we know that's not true now, obviously, but it took us thousands of years to figure that out. Okay, so that's the common land idea. Um, and they, they basically don't trust peasants or uh, other people that are lower because they think they're stupid, if you want to make it simple. All right, so Things that controlled what you could and couldn't do. Feudalism is definitely one. All right. But what if I'm not on a, what if I'm not in a common land area? What if I'm like uh, in town and I make, uh, I don't know, ironworks or I'm a baker or I'm a lumberjack or something? What if I'm somebody in town? Uh, is a lord going to control exactly what I'm doing? No. no. But who would? Because they still do have people in control that determine what you can and can't do. Yeah, that's where you have the <clears throat> guilds come into play. Uh, guilds are going to control what people do. So if I want to, uh, let's see, what can I do? <clears throat> let's use pizza as an example because it's pretty simple. Obviously, you guys know there's a whole bunch of different types of pizzas, right? Hawaiian pepperoni combination, all, all, these, all these different combinations of things. Um, a guild is specific to an industry. So in this case, we'll say pizza, all right? Uh, a pizza guild would be a group of people chosen by that city government, all right? And the city government usually is comprised of people associated with or in this class, all right? So the city government is going to choose who these guilds are, who are in them, and they dictate everything about their industry. So again, we're sticking with pizza here. Uh, we would say in a guild, they would control, if you wanted to be a pizza maker, they would determine uh, who was hired, so who could even be a pizza maker. 
they would determine how much your pizzas should be, uh, um, the price of your pizza. So if you want to charge 10 bucks for a pizza, uh, you'd have to get that approved by them. They would determine how much you could or couldn't charge for that pizza. So they would uh, determine the uh, wage, not the wage, sorry, the price of your pizza. Uh, they would determine how much money you get, your wage. They would determine uh, how you make the pizza and they would determine whether or not your pizza was good enough. Determine its quality. All right. So how much room does that leave me? Let's say they actually approve me to be a pizza maker. How much room does that leave me to uh, try to be creative with my pizza making? None whatsoever, right? So if they say, all you can make is pepperoni, that's all I can make. Even if I think of a, a great idea about having, oh, just cheese, or a vegetarian pizza, or Hawaiian, or whatever, I wouldn't be able to try it. And if I did, if I went behind their backs and did it, they would take my license and kick me out of town. And back then, that's almost as good as a death sentence. Because back then, you couldn't just go from town to town. Back then, it was like as isolated as you can possibly think. Your city was almost like your country. Most people never, ever, ever left their initial house or town. And if they did, it was like a whole new culture of people that would not accept you. All right, so you had to listen to these guilds, because otherwise, they would get rid of you. And again, that was almost as good as a death sentence back in the... Uh, uh, prior to the uh, 1700s as far as how people um, lived back then. All right, so these guilds, they control what you can and can't do, uh, or your lords or kings control what you can and can't do. And remind me again, why did they believe the kings and the nobles and these guilds should dictate what you make, how much you make of it, who gets the profits? Why would they do that? Why did they think that was a good idea? Because they were um, considered like smarter, better. Than yes, exactly. They... They trusted themselves because they thought that they were better or smarter. Uh, but they, more importantly, they did not trust you as an individual. Uh, they thought you would make a mistake. Uh, you would make the pizza wrong. You would charge too much. Your quality wouldn't be good enough. Um, they didn't trust you to uh, uh, um, protect everybody else uh, or, or run the land. It's just that they did not trust individuals. That's what it really comes down to. So prior to the 1700s, how can we phrase this? There was no trust for individual ability. Now this sounds ridiculous because now we know, obviously, uh, anyone can be good at something. You never know. Obviously, we're not all good at everything, but you don't know what you're good at, right? That's why people like kids so much because there's so much potential there. It's like, well, what the hell is this guy going to be or girl going to be? You know, they could be the future president, or the future Jeff Bezos, or the future Elon Musk, or they could be nobody. But you don't know what they could do, <coughs> all right? But they didn't believe that back then. They thought it was impossible, unless you were born in these classes, uh, or associated with the city government, which meant you pretty much had to be in these classes, uh, that uh, you had no potential. There was just zero potential, you were limited. Uh, but we know that is not the case now. So when we talk more so next week, um, about modern economics. It's really just us deciding and finding out, hey, uh, we can actually make our own decisions. And yeah, sure, not everyone's gonna be super good at every single thing, but if you give them a chance, they'll find out what they are good at, uh, and the uh, actual world will get much better because of it. All right, so we, that's pretty much all the stuff I want you to know from last week, as far as uh, what these guilds were, uh, what the feudal system was, what common land was, uh, and those other terms as well. The one thing I want to add to that was this got really, uh, what's the word looking for? Corrupt, because these guilds that would control an entire city, as far as all the stuff they would make, they started working with guilds in other cities. Uh, so pretty quickly in Europe, you had multiple large cities that were pretty wealthy, all working together uh, to control all of the economics and trade in a region. You guys know what that one was? It's from the, the notes last week. It's not very memorable, I know, especially since I didn't tell it to you, but. Guild network. It was a guild network. It's a trade union. I don't know the name of it. It's in Northern Europe. They controlled everything. In fact, they actually were, these cities worked together to actually um, uh, force kings uh, with entire armies to uh, uh, agree to their trade terms. Somebody had a hand up over there. Hanseatic League. Yeah, that's in Northern Europe. I think they, they found it in 1368. I think that was the year. Um, but yeah, they basically just worked together between cities, and they became so powerful for a while that they could actually tell kings uh, what to do 
and what not to do. But the reason why I want you guys to know these are bad is uh, they don't let you do what you want. And it's important to let people do what they want because again, we don't know what you're gonna be good at um, and we should give people the opportunity to pursue what they're good at um, because they could have really good ideas about better pizzas to make or how to make them better or price them better. Any notes that said 1938? 1938? Oh, this should be 1368. 1938? That was a big typo by me. <laughs> it's definitely 1368. Uh, not 1938. Um, I, you probably need to know the year, so it's, it's irrelevant, but I want you to know the place. Okay, so, and the, the one, uh, I actually forgot one more thing. You can probably tell me this maybe. If my economy is controlled by somebody in the government, whether it's a guild in the city government or uh, part of the feudal system with the controlling of the common land, what kind of economy is that? When somebody is in charge in the government telling me what I can and can't do. When I don't have any freedoms of my own, yeah, what type of an economy is that? A tyranny. It is a tyranny, definitely, but there's a type of uh, economy that, that this is named for. Command. Command economy, exactly. Because they're commanding you what to do. Command economy. All right, <clears throat> what we have is a market economy, meaning no one's really telling you what to do necessarily. There are some limitations, which we'll talk about, but it's pretty much just anything goes. If you wanna go start a business and try to make your own pizza, um, you can go do that. All right, that's a market economy. And your success will depend on how good your pizza is, how well uh, you market and let people know that your store even exists, um, and then of course, how you price it, how you locate your store, all that stuff. All right, that's a market economy. The command economy, though, is when somebody else in the government, a central authority, whether it's a king, a noble, a guild, whoever, a president, they're dictating what the economy is and what you can and can't do. All right, that's a command economy. All right, so based on what you know now, do command economies sound very efficient? No, they're not because they're, they don't trust you, essentially. They don't trust you as an individual uh, to go out and start a business. And can we all make a successful business? No, but there's many people that can and we need to find out who can and who can't. All right, cool. And who got the command economy one? Was it, did you get the command economy? Yeah, you did. Sweet.